on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome Sandra Steingraber. She is the author of Raising Elijah, Protecting Our Children in an Age of Environmental Crisis, as well as Living Downstream and Having Faith, and also the subject of a documentary um, uh, by the same uh, name, uh, Living Downstream. Uh, welcome to the program, Sandra. Thank you for so much for having me. So um, y your book is, um, it, it's, it, it really is fantastic. I have um, uh, two uh, young children myself. Um, we have gone through much of the sort of the, the, the same processes that you, you speak of in terms of, of, of dealing with the many ecological threats uh, to our children. But I, I want to start first with this concept that you talk about in your book, well-informed futility. Can, can you ex <laughs> explain what that is? Sure. That's a concept I uh, introduced right at the beginning of the book because I have come to believe it's, the, it's our biggest problem for solving the very real environmental um, Cri the very real environmental crisis that threatens the lives of our children. Of course, there are very many um, entrenched economic interests, uh, the fossil fuel industry being one, that are at the source of the problem. Um, but it's people's advanced resignation, their willingness to give up the fight before they've even enjoined it, that I find to be the biggest issue. People find this problem overwhelmingly depressing in a way that, you know, other problems like uh, terrorism or uh, a pedophile located in your community. All these other um, big and scary problems can um, swing us into action, but the idea that uh, the world's plankton stocks are in trouble and therefore our oxygen supply is in trouble because plankton make us half the oxygen we breathe, and of course our kids need an oxygen supply. They need ice caps frozen to provide a, a, a normal weather pattern for them to grow crops. All these things cause our eyes to glaze over and cause us to be depressed. And so it turns out psychologists have a name for this phenomenon. It's called well-informed futility. And it refers to the feeling that we have when we learn about something that we feel that we have no agency over. So we hear about a terrible problem. We don't think there's anything we can do to fix it. And so it makes us feel so much unbearable grief or guilt or rage that rather than continue to feel that way, we start to turn away from more knowledge itself and then simply put our head in the sand and take a hear no evil, see no evil approach to it. It's very easy to do that when you have young kids because, of course, your job is to protect your children and not make them feel scared about something. And so you don't necessarily want to have a conversation about the fact that one in every four mammals is now going extinct because of climate change around the dinner table. <laughs> and so because we don't want to talk about it in front of our kids, we parents end up not talking about it at all and live in this kind of infantilized, happy bubble uh, and w uh, in which both, you know, bad news doesn't penetrate. And so that's the starting point of Raising Elijah, I want to march my readers right out of that bad place and make them feel that um, their action is actually going to make them feel better. And it, it, it's, it, it's interesting, too, because there's this, um, uh, this in many respects, the, the agency that we have is, is, is both in the context of what we can do as individuals to protect our individuals' families, but, but ultimately that's not really that's not really enough in some respects. In other words, our... Right, so I take it, yeah, so here's where my biologist background kind of comes into play. So Raising Elijah is really two books in one. It's my life um, in this sort of sloppy ecology of my own household where I'm, you know, a busy working m mother with these two lovely children, um, one of whom, Elijah, is, is born and, and, and grows up, you know, in the course of, of the book. Um, and so you look at, you know, you see my laundry cycle and my food chain and, uh, and how, how my husband and I do things in our house. But I'm also then taking a look at larger biological data to ask questions like, okay, I have given up a lawnmower and I've changed it out for a rotary mower. And in so doing, it turns out it actually saves me time because I use it like um, a Nautilus machine in the gym. And so I can get my daily workout and get the grass cut at the same time um, and so it works for me, and I'm actually, you know, not putting X amount of carbon into the atmosphere and not creating um, carcinogenic smog that my son who has asthma would have to breathe. So what if we all did that? Would that actually make a difference? And it turns out if you scale up our individual responses like that, it actually doesn't make much of a difference. We need much larger scale um, 
change that involves redesigning our communities um, involves fossil fuel companies having a willingness to leave their assets, their proven resources, reserves of fossil fuels actually in the ground and a willingness to abandon that and go do something different. And so how can we bring about those kind of changes? So, you know, it, the, the book really ranges from um, me as a breastfeeding mother who's out there um, mowing the grass while my child is nursing under the tree <laughs> to me as the biologist looking at these large-scale planetary uh, data and um, and thinking about how parents can join this big human rights movement um, that I see happening, which is a move away from this ruinous dependency on fossils, lighting them on fire to make our tea kettles whistle, and um, looking elsewhere for our sources of energy, namely looking at wind, water, and, and solar for, for running things. You talk about it as a human rights struggle, and you... Um uh, you 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 compare it to the uh, to uh, the abolition of slavery in many respects and um, uh, uh, talk about this because there's the it's it's both in terms of the w the implications for us as individuals in our rights to not have uh, what you call I think um, uh, trespass by toxins and also in terms of what it means for society in that society has to make a decision about, uh, on on an economic level that is analogous to the one that we had to make with slavery. Right. Well, well, that's well said. And, and so, indeed, um, comparing our current situation to the abolitionist movement of the 1830s is um, a, a dominant part of the narrative of Raising Elijah, and it starts with the title itself. So my son is actually named Elijah, but his namesake, I named him after a childhood hero of mine, which is the... Uh, um, an Illinois abolitionist from the 1830s whose name was Elijah Lovejoy. Um, and I was uh, particularly moved by this. I mean, he's somebody that all Illinois school children used to learn about. Um, he lived just down the Illinois River from where I grew up. And he was a writer um, and an author like I am. And living across the Mississippi from Missouri, which was a slave state, he saw the slave trade uh, up close and personal. And it bothered him greatly, as it did a lot of people who lived in the free state of Illinois. But what really pushed him over the edge to abolitionist activism was when he became a father. So he had a two-year-old son, and his wife was pregnant with their second child, and his heart just broke open in, in seeing um, children sold away from their parents and families being broken up, knowing that how much parents, the kind of love, the big love that all parents have for their children. And so he faced a dilemma then because he knew that then that slavery was an abomination and he was um, committed to the for the rest of his life to ending this and dismantling this institution. But at the same time, it brought danger upon himself because pro-slavery mobs started, you know, throwing brickbats through his windows. And um, so meanwhile, his two-year-old and his pregnant wife had to all sort of sleep in the same bed and he had to sort of defend them. And he worried that if he, his life was lost, of course, then he wasn't really being a good father to his own children. And plus, all this abolitionist work was taking him away from making money and from um, being with his family and so on. So he wrote these personal letters to his mother about this dilemma he faced, that he had to do this as a father, and yet he was a terrible father for doing it. And so how, how to deal with that? And he finally decided that he was that this, this larger need to recreate our nation's economy so his children could grow up in a place where no one was enslaved was, his, was really what he was called to do. So he was assassinated in the end um, in his 30s, uh, on his actually 35th birthday, uh, he was buried and pumped full of five bullets by a pro-slavery mob who dumped his printing press into the Mississippi River, um, his home being in Alton, Illinois. And so, you know, he was martyred, and yet his words um, went on to inspire Harriet Beecher Stowe, Abraham Lincoln, John Brown, the Boston abolitionists, and so on. And so I really wanted to resurrect that spirit of abolition to say that, you know, there was a time in our history where people insisted that even though our economy was ruinously dependent on this institution. In that time, it was slavery. There was personal wealth bound up. It kept the cost of goods low, kept us competitive in the world market. Everyone kind of benefited from slave unpaid labor uh, as consumers, whether you owned slaves or not. And, and yet, somebody had to stand up and say, you know what, this is an abomination. It has to stop, and it has to stop now. And I don't care how much social unrest is created, and I don't care how much personal wealth is, evaporates in so doing with immediate emancipation. And so I think our situation now is analogous, right? That I think we now have become enslaved to fossil fuels, 
It's having a ruinous effect on our climate, um, interfering now with our ability to have reliable grain harvests, interfering with pollination systems. All of these things our children need, and it's our job as parents to make sure they're there for them. Um, and at the same time, as my colleague Bill McGibbon says, it's as though we're mounting an, a movement against ourselves. It's as though the slave owners are, are leading the abolitionist movement because all of us um, depend on low cost of um, gas, oil, and coal. Um, our retirement accounts are invested in it. Um, we heat our homes with it and so on. And so we're in a really vexing and tricky situation. And mounting a, a human rights movement is the kind of uh, uh, the way out of it is what I argue in Raising Elijah. And, and in some respects, I mean, you have, I mean, it's, it's clear how you have resolved that, that, that um, or, or maybe, maybe you haven't resolved it. It's, it's uh, uh, ongoing, but that, uh, that, that um, the ambivalence between uh, being there for your kids and, uh, but also in some ways, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, being there for your kids in sort of a, a way that is more abstract or, or one in which, uh, maybe abstract is the wrong word, but one which affects society at large, but in some ways may inhibit your ability to be there for your kids at that moment. I mean, I'm thinking last month, I mean, I, I imagine you just recently got out of prison. I mean, uh, about two weeks ago. <laughs> I did, jail. yes. And actually, I'm talking to you today from Norman, Oklahoma, where I am teaching a class. Um, in fact, I just left my class where we were just talking about all these issues, um, teaching an, an honors class in uh, extreme energy extraction and environmental health. Um, uh, and I felt compelled to come to Oklahoma, where, you know, just down the road here from some of the world's biggest oil and gas industry. Some of my students are um, petroleum engineering majors, um, and yet they, you know, my class was over-enrolled. There's this deep uh, need to learn about and talk about these issues, but being here this week ta certainly takes me away from my own children who are in New York, um, and as you suggest, I also recently got out of jail for having done an act of civil disobedience, uh, which I felt called, uh, to, called to do um, in my work to halt the expansion of the infrastructure for fracking, which is a technique that is blowing up the bedrock of our nation in order to bring hydrocarbon gases like methane, which is natural gas, but also propane and butane, which are now being stored under the lake near which I live, um, which is a source of drinking water for 100,000 of us. And so um, that was uh, where I planted my own flag of civil disobedience uh, and, and went to jail. And, and it actually gave, you know, every year I do an Earth Day lecture. I'm always somewhere uh, talking on Earth Day. This year I was delivering my Earth Day lecture from cell number one at cell block 5D in the Shimong County Jail in the southern tier of New York. And, uh, but I feel like that was the most important scientific statement that I could make. And as I told my children before I went to jail, um, you know, mom's on the job. I mean, it is my job to make sure that my children are protected from harm and they have a future. They can't have a future if the planet's uh, climate system is wrecked to the point where they can't have stable food anymore. So just in the same way that uh, it's my job to make sure there's money for them to go to college and um, you know, they get to their piano lessons on time and all the rest um, and, and wear their bike helmets when they ride their bike because they protect them from dangerous situations. This, the situation that we, we, face with, we face with fossil fuels has become very dangerous, not only because of things that have happened within my lifetime, but the fact that other generations before me have failed to mount uh, a challenge that's sufficient to, to the task um, so that we now face, you know, because of a cumulative effect here, we face these uh, calamitous uh, tipping points and a, a big cliff of calamity that we're about to go over. And that it's my job as a parent, not only as a biologist, but also as a mom, to, to stop that. So, so I have told my children that there may be a time when I can be a better mother to you inside of a jail cell than outside, and I realize that will cause you to cry, but I'm hoping that your tears will be less <laughs> than the, t the tears of all children and grandchildren to come if we don't take action. And what I say in Raising Elijah about all that, which of course was written before I actually put on the orange jumpsuit and went to jail, but I was sort of anticipating that day might come as I wrote. What I say about all that is, you know, this is not that unusual, that when I look back in history, starting with Elijah Lovejoy, there were all kinds of parents um, who, were, who loved their children just as much as we do, who were just as busy, who worked just as hard, and had to balance, you know, buying the costume for the school play with the report that's due tomorrow at work, and the kid who's homesick and throwing up all night while you're trying to, you know, get your house redecorated. I mean, these are things that we that are just have always gone on. 
And yet there have been parents, whether Elijah Lovejoy or in the case of my dad's generation, people who fought against uh, the rise of global fascism who had to work against Hitler at great risk to themselves and at risk to their own children and had to send their children away some, in some cases to, to grow up away from them so they didn't, in case they were caught, they didn't you know, put their children's lives at jeopardy. Well, now there is no safe place to send our children. The whole planet is in jeopardy. And so we might have to send ourselves away you know, um, to be apart from our kids in order to be a better parent to them. Yeah. In my own life, I have a great marriage, and so um, you know, my, my work is made easier by the fact that my husband and I um, co-parent, and, and as, as Jeff says, it, you know, that's, why, that's why kids have two parents in case, <laughs> in case one of them has to go to jail. So, well, um, so we're making it work, and I hope my story um, is inspiring in some way to others. 